Welcome to our webinar today about marbled murrelet conservation and the Northwest Forest Plan. I'm Steve Homer, Senior Policy Advisor with American Bird Conservancy. A number of factors that influence forest policy in the Pacific Northwest. Um, science, indications of increased loss of species, fragmentation of habitat, diminished water quality, loss of old growth forest, loss of large blocks of forest, all of these have been very uh, well documented. Um, there's a, a management history in the region where you know there's been a long history of intensive logging during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. The federal forests were significantly overcut. Uh, a very small percentage of the original old growth forest remains. Um, even less of that remains on private and state lands where it's been largely liquidated. Uh, the, the public desires, um, I think, have been shifting over time, a lot more interest and uh, emphasis on um, conservation, protection of wildlife, and an understanding about ecosystems and, and, and the limits um, of development within those ecosystems. And lastly, the law. Um, the United States is blessed with a, a, a strong legal framework. Um, you know, in the Northwest, we have a number of endangered species, northern spotted owl, marble murrelet, a uh, number of salmon stocks. And it's through NEPA um, that the public is, and, and NIFMA that the public has been allowed to um, have a much greater degree of participation in how the public lands are managed. And that participation has, has led to a lot of changes. And uh, where once there was pretty much a, a focus um, solely on resource extraction, now a lot of the other values such as recreation and clean water and, and most recently carbon storage are really starting to, uh, to get some consideration. One of the big drivers that we see um, right now in terms of the current forest debate has to do with county payments. Uh, there was a, a law passed in 2000 um, championed by Senator Rod Wyden that replaced uh, the, the drop in uh, logging revenue um, as the program went to more sustainable levels and provided payments to counties that historically had received a percentage of the timber sale receipts. And this was a very important uh, reform because it decoupled these payments and uh, stopped the incentive to overcut the forest. And so we think that's a very important um, uh, policy advance. And uh, we're interested in seeing that, uh, that this program continue to be reauthorized and extended until a permanent replacement program can be enacted. And if you look at this chart, you uh, can get a sense of um, how much uh, funding um, came through the revenue sharing program and then how there was an effort through the SRS to try to replace some of those um, historic uh, payments. Now, it is important to remember that during this period, particularly in the 70s and 80s, that we were looking at extreme overcutting of the forest. And so some of these payment levels um, really are a reflection um, of the overcutting that was taking place during that period. If, uh, if some people had their way, they'd go back to that old system and basically rely on logging um, to try to come up with the payments to counties. The problem with this is that the past overcutting has simply left too little high value forest. And when you start thinking about the other values that these high value forests provide, there really isn't a lot of just uh, of, of, you know, spare old growth forest that we have uh, to go after these days. So um, we really are in a situation. Uh, we're also in a global marketplace, and uh, we've seen timber prices drop considerably from where they were. Um, global competition has uh, you know, made it possible for the US to import uh, timber at a, at a much lower cost. Uh, timber receipts would provide $242 million less than the counties received in 2011. And so if we went back to that old system, the counties would really end up hurt, being, being hurt. Uh, we think that a better solution would be to try to revise the, uh, the PILT program, payments in lieu of taxes. And what it does is it provides um, counties with federal lands a payment uh, based on the number of acres that they have. Um, we do think that the formula could be um, slightly revised to, to tilt it a little bit more in favor of rural counties. And uh, this could be combined with the SRS program to provide a permanent and stable base of, of, for rural economic development in this country. Um, We'd also like to see the ONC Act of 1937, which gave a particularly favorable deal to, uh, to a few Oregon counties um, to be abolished and to see those counties and the federal force in those lands um, managed under the same system that we work under everywhere else. 
So one of the things that uh, you know you might think about, well, this is supposed to be about the marbled murrelet, and um, you know one of the things that's happened in the, the management of the Northwest forest is that uh, the marbled murrelet has really taken a back seat to the northern spotted owl, and, and the owl um, occupies a much larger range. The murrelet's just in the coastal area, and so I thought I would start out talking a little bit about the owl and, and, and talk about how it's um, had a, a recent effect on the murrelet. Um, just last year, there was the completion of the Northern Spotted Owl Critical Habitat Rule. Um, this rule protects approximately 1.1 million acres of high-quality habitat um, in the matrix. Uh, some 4 million additional acres were designated over the previous rule, so it's a, it's a reflection of the, the latest available science that shows that there needs to be additional habitat protection for the Northern Spotted Owl as a result of, of habitat loss and now the invasion of the barred owl. Uh, unfortunately, the rule allows for adverse modification of owl habitat in non-high quality or occupied owl habitat in the matrix. And uh, we really think that this was kind of fudging uh, the available science. They're, they're claiming that there, there are forest benefits from these types of treatments. Um, we don't see any evidence that the northern spotted owl will, will be a beneficiary. Um, in fact, there's a lot of indications that, that, that these proposals are going to cause short-term harm to the owl at a time when then when we can really be you know ill afford to be losing more. Um, the other part of the problem with this critical habitat rule is it does allow for these uh, these uh, logging treatments, including clear cutting, that would fragment and disturb forest in the marble murrelet zone. And uh, the latest indications are is that this would be a uh, a direct conflict with uh, what's needed for the murrelet. And in fact, <clears throat> in the agency's own rule, they identified. Um, those treatments as a threat to the marbled murrelet, and yet they didn't do anything to um, to mitigate for that. Um, just to, to go over a little bit more about the additional habitat protection, um, you know, there's a, a need right now to um, to push things in a, in a positive direction in terms of additional acres being protected, um, expansion of the late successional reserves to include that high quality um, owl habitat in the matrix. And there's also Recovery Action 12, which deals with post-fire logging. Um, after fires, there has historically been a great deal of logging in those snag forests, and this has actually created a shortage of these large structures out on the forest. Um, this has been a significant harm to a number of cavity nesting species, and, and again, it was recommended that there be limits on post-fire logging as a, as a means of conserving the northern spotted owl. Uh, the uh, other thing that really came out of the OWL rule was the importance of the reserves. Uh, when you look at the uh, the evidence, um, it does appear uh, from the Forest Service 10 and 15 reviews show that the plan is working. And, and basically the idea of the plan was to create a system of reserves and to allow the, the younger and mature forests within those reserves to grow old. And so in the end, we will have large blocks of old growth forest again and it's in those large blocks that we can hope to secure the, the northern spotted owl and marbled murrelet and, and have the highest water quality. And so it does look like this system is working. Um, it is a 100-year plan, and we're about 20 years into this 100-year plan. Um, the forests are growing back, and uh, so there's every indication that, that this, uh, this plan is working and should be allowed to continue to work. Now, the um, concern that we have is the desire to see an increase in logging is pushing forward some ideas that we think would be detrimental to marble murrelets and water quality. Um, ecological forestry, as defined in the final owl critical habitat rule, is basically something that you do for areas that you're already planning on doing logging. This is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a restoration treatment. This is, in fact, a type of logging, clear cutting, um, that would be used to replace the current thinning regime. Um, the rule analyzed this and suggested that you would only get about 10% more timber if you go to this clear cutting over the current thinning. And so we don't really think that, you know, given the, the tremendous environmental harm that would result from this clear cutting, uh, we think that we're much better off staying uh, with the current thinning regime and keeping it focused on the younger forests that are not yet owl habitat. Um, that is a real concern to be eliminating um, any owl habitat right now, and, and it looks really just like a, an effort to convert native forests into tree farms. It's really important to remember that the owl uh, rule was by no means strongly supported by the scientific community. The peer reviewers criticized active management and the idea of moving to a reserveless strategy. It really appears that the uh, foresters and people in the land management agencies that want to see more active management 
have pushed forward a plan very similar to the Bush administration plan that does not meet the best available science and that in fact would lead to potentially overcutting and cutting of the wrong forest. Uh, of particular concern is the owl. Uh, it looks like these treatments that are being proposed would actually benefit the barred owl and facilitate barred owl invasion of more owl territories. And we see no studies anywhere that indicate the northern spotted owl would benefit from these types of treatments. And of course, the big justification comes back to fire. And when you take a closer look at the fire data, it does not support um, you know, the idea that there's been a huge increase in high intensity catastrophic fires. In fact, uh, fewer acres have been lost so far to fire than was originally predicted in 1994 under the Northwest Forest Plan. So the notion that we've you know, reached this new era of catastrophic fires is, is simply not borne out by the facts. We're pleased to say that in the final rule there were some significant limits placed on this active management. Um, the focus was put more emphasis on younger stands, lower quality owl habitat, keep it limited to the matrix, avoid reserves in high quality habitat, avoid con converting suitable owl habitat um, to early seral, Another concern is the, the possibility of the elimination of the uh, owl reserves. Um, there's been talk about revising the ONC Act of 1937. The Forest Service is talking about revising their national forest to eliminate owl reserves. And now we're seeing the new Western Oregon Plan Revision BLM planning process. And so we think that it's very important that the uh, current protections of the Northwest Forest Plan be retained um, in whatever happens with these plan revisions or legislative efforts. Uh, it should be remembered that the Northwest Forest Plan was determined to be barely legal by Judge William Dwyer and that the ONC lands are critically important and simply cannot be removed and still have a, a comprehensive plan and a, an adequate regulatory mechanism for these wide-ranging endangered species. And lastly, we do think that there's other means for creating jobs. Sustainable economic development is a possibility without overcutting the forest. Um, restoration is still needed from the era of overcutting. The Northwest Forest Plan is working, but the forests are heavily fragmented. Um, so there's still a need to do work on the uh, road system. There's still a $10 billion road maintenance backlog across the national forest system. And we're now finding that the non-extractive values, recreation, clean water, flood control, carbon storage, actually significantly exceed the value of, of timber management. And so in, just in terms of the highest and best use of these lands, um, it's becoming increasingly apparent that conservation has real tangible economic benefits. And lastly, when you do look at the timber volume that's been produced under the Northwest Forest Plan, what you in fact find is that the agencies have been uh, consistently delivering what Congress has been financing. Um, some people have been claiming that this isn't what was promised by the Northwest Forest Plan, but it is in fact what Congress has been paying for. And uh, the agencies have been trying uh, very hard to have a, a successful program, and it's just recently as they've started pushing into this new clear cutting that I think that they're going to find that it's going to be difficult to, to make progress with that for the simple reason that public opposition is already starting to grow. And lastly, if you're really looking for a place to find jobs, um, what's happening on the private and state lands in Oregon is notable. Oregon has some of the worst forest practices in the country. As you can see from this clear cut, what happens is the forest is completely removed. All of the structures are removed. There's no woody debris left on the ground whatsoever. And so just in terms of you know, capability for wildlife and other ecosystem services, this is about as the worst kind of management that you could possibly see. This is what's allowed on Oregon state and private lands, which the federal lands are largely embedded within. And so when you see you know, federal lands in Oregon, you can pretty much assume that they're surrounded by a sea of clear cuts like this. Most of this timber from state and private lands right now, a significant amount of it is um, exported raw without any type of processing. And so we're literally bleeding jobs and bleeding our forest overseas and not gaining the full value of our forest. Another key issue is uh, carbon storage. If you want to be responsible in terms of climate policy, uh, logging mature in old forests is the least uh, um, important thing to be doing. In fact, it's the last thing you want to do because these forests store so much carbon. And when you log them, it releases that stored carbon from the soils and the roots. And only a small portion of that carbon uh, bound up in the wood is kept out of the atmosphere for any significant period of time. Um, the California Carbon Registry is working fine. We believe that the state of Oregon should 
uh, rejoin that and so that its landowners could benefit from carbon credits. So now we get to the marbled murrelet. Um, the murrelet, again, has been kind of the forgotten uh, threatened bird in the Northwest. Uh, it lives in the, uh, within about 45 miles of the coast, nests up in the top branches of mature and old trees. Um, but it's showing a very significant decline, 29% uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, the five-year status review indicated it would be extinct within 100 years outside of the Puget Sound area. Uh, the threats are, are the past and ongoing habitat loss. Uh, most of the current habitat loss is happening on state and private lands. Uh, we do not believe that the habitat conservation plans that are currently in place are sufficient. Uh, we also don't believe that there's a sufficient um, habitat acquisition program or restoration program in place to bring about a, enough um, habitat for the murrelet. So we do see some, some needs to stem the loss of habitat and also come up with ways to, um, to uh, develop more over time. Predation seems to be the biggest limiting factor uh, for the murrelet right now. They're just simply not successfully um, uh, nesting and, and bringing um, chicks to, uh, um, to adulthood. And this is a result of fragmentation and other disturbances that are around the murrelet zone. Um, in the, uh, the critical habitat rule for the marbled murrelet, there's about a half mile buffer around the nesting areas. And the, and the thinking there was that that would create a large enough area to um, avoid this disturbance and fragmentation and, and, and keep these predators away from the nest. It's looking like that those uh, buffers are much too small and that, uh, that most likely a mile buffer is what's necessary. Um, there's a new threat, which is the proposed active management under the northern um, spotted owl critical habitat rule, we think that that needs to be um, addressed and so that we're not encouraging more clear cutting in the murrelet zone, which is um, likely to just increase the, the predation. There's a big discussion going on about the ONC lands right now, and I just thought it's important to see how important the ONC lands are for the marbled murrelet. Um, if you look at the, the gray areas on this map, these are the, uh, the, the late successional reserves that have been designated um, on the BLM managed land. This includes some of the checkerboard areas, and it's very important to note that, that you know, within that checkerboard, on the private land, on the other sections, there is pretty much no forest. It has been largely completely decimated. And so these areas are critically important for the simple reason there is no other habitat nearby. Uh, we do anticipate a marbled murrelet critical habitat revision is going to be coming up soon. And uh, we have a number of recommendations. A letter was actually just sent to President Obama to follow up on some of the concerns that stemmed out of the uh, changes to the Northwest Forest Plan and the Owl Critical Habitat Rule and to talk about the latest scientific findings. And we believe that what needs to happen now is a, um, a new planning effort made for the marbled murrelet that would specifically look at the reserves and figure out how they could be expanded um, to provide enough habitat. And um, this is going to have to um, you know, possibly look at also the, the high quality owl habitat that's in the matrix and redesignating um, areas so that we take these areas out of the timber base and, uh, and not you know, continue to, uh, to fragment and disturb those areas. Uh, we also believe that the, um, the jobs issue and the county payments issue does need to be um, adequately addressed. We support valid forest restoration and we're going to be supporting a revised tilt program that's more tilted to rural counties so that we can have a, a strong base um, of support for rural economic development and, uh, and again, abolish the ONC Act of 1937 so that we have a fair system for everybody. Be happy to now answer um, any questions that you might have. Again, this is Steve Homer, Senior Policy Advisor with the American Bird Conservancy. Thanks again for joining us.